I think you need, because you need to implement the heat file yeah, in the form yeah, of that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I understand that, but yeah. my question is like, so uh, like from the disk, yes. the pages are kept on, the pages are being loaded, right? Yeah. Uh, but where is this heat file? Like, is the heat file on the disk as well, or is the heat file in the memory? It says you need to access the heat file from the disk. Okay. See? Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to write out, read or write out the data from the disk. Okay. So you must access the disk. Okay. So that means that the disk actually has heat file in it? Yeah. And the pages are inside heat yes. file? Yes. Okay. So when we are actually reading from the disk, we are actually taking the heat file? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You need to find heat file first, right? Because right. You can keep track of the
老，好多臭老，你看连着，我臭一模一样，我肯定你怎么老，全都是臭的，就像，都一模一样，哪一天？就没有很多学生啊，我靠，基本上是没有几百样，你发现没有很多几百样。<laughs> All right, so does anyone have a VGA cable? Just the, this lecture room is supposed to have a VGA cable, but somebody uh, took it. So I cannot use my, uh, I don't have a VGA cable with me right now. I can go and uh, get one from my office, but uh, it will take quite some time. Uh, anyone have a VGA cable right now with you? So, uh, so Chi Yuan, can you do me a favor and check the other rooms? I'm not sure where is the KJ uh, table. <laughs> I never use it. Uh, I'm not sure the, the how it looks. Like well, the, 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 the lecture, lecture hall across the hallway uh -huh. uh, has, have similar settings to this, right? They must have a VGA cable. Okay. If you don't have a lecture going on right now, you can go ahead and fetch that one. Okay. And check really quick. Okay, well, <clears throat> we're waiting for the TAs to get me a VGA cable. Any, I will take this opportunity to answer any question you may have for the uh, project. That's one. Have you started? Yeah, question. So there's some things, uh, like some functions you have to implement that say that like the parameter, like an index i, must be a valid like index. So what do we do if it's not? Okay, I see what you mean. So in a real system, yes, you need to do error checking in the sense that using a search and, uh, you know, in C++, C, uh, C language as a search or some other kind of uh, uh, error checking mechanism. Uh, on this particular product, and not only for that one, I mean, carry it on to other lab or something as well, uh, you can assume that we will only give you test cases with valid input. So, Meaning that we are not uh, so strict in terms of checking your code uh, with respect to invalid input instances. Do not worry about that so much. But in your real system, right? I'm saying after you graduate from this class, you go out and build your own system down the road. You definitely need to watch out for those uh, error checkings. Okay. Any other? Uh, so I got the video because so we're ready to go. So along those lines, is it bad if we've been just having to throw whatever exception that it says? That well, you can throw exception, yes, and um, uh, and you know if you throw an exception in Java, there are a couple of things you can do, right? Which is throw an existing exception that either defined by the original Java API or defined by Simple DB, or you can even define your own exception and throw it, right? However, <coughs> in our case, in the, in the, along the same spirit, my earlier reply. You know, in a real system, you want to throw a meaningful exception so that whoever catch that exception can do, uh, uh, can, 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 can use that information to do a more effective bug tracing. But in our case, as long as you handle that exception, you throw that exception, you can just throw a generic exception. All exceptions in Java, if you don't know this, are extended or inherited from the base class of an exception. 
So no matter what specific exception you are throwing, you can just throw it as an exception object. That makes sense? So you can just do that. That's good enough. Any other questions while I'm standing up my lecture here? Uh, can we add whatever like helper function we want? You can, yes. Actually, if you look at the lab one uh, documentation, uh, not only you can add helper functions, you can even change existing APIs if you feel that's what you need to do. Obviously, you don't have to change the existing APIs because, because the, the original simple DB was constructed based on the API I give, I give out to you guys. Right? So there must be an implementation that work with existing APIs. However, for some, whatever reason you find existing API are somewhat hard to work with for your purposes, and you can you want to change the APIs in some manner ways, you can do that, but if you read towards the end of that one uh, assignment description, it says that if you do that, you do need to document that in that two-pager you're going to submit along with your code to justify why you have to make that change to the API. Okay. So you're welcome to do that. And I think helper function is even a lesser uh, impact to the system architecture, so definitely you are allowed to do that. Okay. And then on when we get like lab two, are we going to be building on our solution for lab one or will you give us code that we start from? Good question. So <coughs> the way you know let me explain a little bit how a simple DB lab is designed. So I have a manifest list. The manifest list is a text file that I was typing the class names. So whatever class file on that manifest list will be the source code that I will be distributing out for a given lab. So basically I have a manifest list for lab 1, manifest list for lab 2, and so on and so forth. Okay? And within each class file, meaning the source code, the .prova file, if it is one of the manifest list, if it is one of the files in the manifest list, I, will, I have a Python script going to that Java code and scans through that Java code. And on every function of that Java code, it actually has a comment section that says, this is the part to be stripped out. There's a special tag, kind of like an HTML tag, you can imagine like that, that indicates the star region of code to be stripped out, and the end region of code to be stripped out. So there's the Python script, look at the manifest uh, list for each uh, source code over there, go find that file, under the source folder and, and simply scan through that code and whenever you find that opening tag and closing tag to strip code out, it will strip that code out. And then that will produce the output file as part of the solution to that lab. That makes sense? Okay, that being said, so for lab for lab two, yes, we will be using some of the lab one classes, not all of it. We, it's, it is dependent on some of your lab one code, such as heap file. Right? So you can either use your own implementation, or you can use the description I will be giving out. However, I will not give you the source code for those dependent files. I will give you the doc class file for those dependent files. Of course, you can argue if you know compiler really well and if you know Java really well, <coughs> Java is really easy to be reverse engineered. Does that make sense? Because Java compiler doesn't compile a Java code into binary code, into machine code tied with the specific underlying architecture. For example, if it's an x86 architecture, a typical C++, C++ or C compiler will compile a C or C++ code into instruction site. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> will compile into instructions tied with the instruction set of that particular architecture. Which means it's really hard for you, given the compiled binary code of C or C++, to reverse that back to the original C or C++ source code because of that. Okay? Because a lot of uh, machine level optimization, that's just so hard for anyone to kind of uh, uh, reverse that process. However, Java is different. Java, one feature of Java, as all of you know, is the so-called platform independence. Meaning that the same Java code doesn't need any modification. You can run that on x86. You can also run that on your iOS, which is 
uh, underlying architecture is uh, uh, is ARM. You know ARM. ARM is uh, uh, the processor for the smartphone, right? So it's actually a different architecture, different set of instruction for ARM and for x86. But the same drama code works. Why? The reason is there's no magic. The reason is drama compiler does not compile a drama code into binary code that's architecture dependent. Rather, it compiles into something called the bias code. And Java has its own what we call virtual machine, GVM, which you can imagine this kind of like a, a set of a, 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 a compiler or a runtime that understands the instruction set defined by Java, which is independent from the underlying architecture. Okay? So, so that means your Java code can run in any platform. However, that also means if someone understands GVM really well, which you could, you can easily uh, decode that bytecode. Imagine yourself just as the GVM. And there are plenty of open source, <coughs> since you mentioned, I don't want to mention this, but since you asked, there are plenty of open source implementation out there that take a dot class file. In fact, not only a single dot class, but a package of dot class files, meaning really complex project. And you run that open source code, it gives you the source code back. So that, that being said, <coughs> so you ask a really good question, there is a non-reply. But with all this being explained, yes, I'm giving you out the the files in dot class format, meaning the bytecode, okay? Not the source code. I give you the bytecode for those dependent files that you need for lab two that come from lab one. So you can either use that. You don't need the source code, you only need the bytecode. But you can understand the API of that bytecode by looking at, even if, let's say, you fail to implement your lab one, you still have the distribution that you got. So that gives you the API information. That's all you need to know. You view it as kind of a black box. Or if you are fairly confident in your own implementation, you your own implementation. But then, of course, the, the downside of using your own implementation, the potential downside, is that you may have some bugs that you are not aware of because you may have passed all the tests we have but still have some bugs that may surface later on in your product. It could be lab two or lab three or all the way down to lab six. Then it makes it a little bit harder for you to debug because you, you cannot assume that this black box works but actually this black box has some effects. Uh, without your knowledge, does that make sense? Using our distribution, yes, our distribution may have some defects as well but at least it works for all the subsequent that test that we have done. Okay. All right, fantastic. I think those are excellent questions. Uh, how are you guys doing on that one? Let me just ask you guys. Have you uh, implemented at least, you know, we I break out that one into several uh, smaller exercises, right? Have anyone, any team, at least finish uh, exercise one? Fantastic. Exercise two. Exercise number three. Wow, exercise number four, almost. Wow, we have exercise number four here, right? We only have, what, five or six, right? So you're almost done. You know, I think, you know, if you look at this assignment, right, at the first look, this is, looks like really a formidable enemy, right? So complex, so big, hard to tackle. But, but as, as soon as you calm down and work on it, step by step, it's not that difficult. And that's how system is built, by the way. A system as complex as Google, as complex as Oracle, you know, before taking class, you might think, oh, I can never build a system like Oracle did this. Or. But you know what? You can. You totally can. What you are doing is a great, not as complex as Oracle did this, but not, not far short from what Oracle is. Does that make sense? So you should have that confidence. Believe in yourself, you can do it, and not only can do it, I believe all of you can do an excellent job in this as well. So I have total confidence in all of you, okay? Alright, right, let's get back to our lecture time. And at the end of the day, you will, I hope you find, you will agree with me that, uh, that this is an interesting exercise as well, at the end of the day, when you finish lab one and lab two. Is that 
Oh, okay. The the question. Let me repeat the question in case people there didn't catch that. Uh, in terms of the workload, how does that one in terms of the workload right, compare against the rest of the labs? Uh, I would say lab two is comparable to lab one, and then maybe lab four and five is a little bit. It's, it's kind of hard for me to give an uh, absolute answer to this because it really depends on how well you understand a particular concept. Later on, we'll be talking, for example, like while you ask, I think one of the students asked an excellent question on Canvas about whether your code needs to be threat safe because he's thinking about concurrent access in database, right? So he's thinking ahead of us because I haven't talked about concurrent access in database systems. In database systems, concurrent access it's not implemented by threading, but rather through another technique called transactions, right? So we will have lab on transactions. So I use transaction as an example, right? If you understand transactions concept, it's concurrency control and recovery, then those lab assignments will be easy for you in terms of the amount of code you have to write. However, if you have a hard time in understanding the concept of transaction and the principle how that works, even if it's just, let's say, less than 100 lines of code, it will be still so hard for you to write. So, in terms of workload, I think it's like, all the labs are roughly the same, in my opinion. But some lab, you might find it a little bit more challenging, simply not because of the amount of code you have to write. Not in terms of, not in terms of, not in terms of this, okay, not in terms of this. Uh, but really in terms of how well you understand the concept go behind it. That's why I feel the lectures are really what matter the most. Because as soon as you understand, if you, if, you know, for those who have done like one for the most part already, if you think about what you have done over there compared to the concept we covered in lecture, essentially the same. It's just you need to translate this into those lines of code. But if you don't understand how keep file works, if you don't understand how a record is organized, even if it's just 10 out of code, you are not able to write it, no matter how many months or how many days I gave you to work. Right? So I think to understand the concept from the lecture is really, really important. All right, so that being said, let's get started. OK. So I think this is where we stopped last time. I talked about the volcano model. And I talk about the iterator interface, and uh, you are supposed to uh, implement an iterator as part of your lab one. Later on, we will have more detailed discussion on uh, implementing different uh, uh, iterator interface inside of database kernel because not only you need to implement the scan operator, you need to implement many other different operators. But the simplest example I can give you, which you will be doing in your lab one, is the scan operator. The scan operator. So it all follows this volcano model we talked about last time. So this is the abstract definition for that class. But essentially, it's kind of like a volcano in the sense that, as I explained in the last lecture, you can think about uh, tuples or records uh, as lava coming out from that volcano. Right? So it, it's always one by one. That's the point of why we refer to this as a volcano model. And I have the initialization uh, method next and close. And if you look at uh, uh, how we materialize this interface for the scan operator, we will have uh, the initialization method to set up the internal state. And the next will simply fetch the next record one by one. Essentially. And, and close will be used to close the file, the heat file, underlying heat file, and uh, clean up the internal state. Okay? So that's a simple implementation of the scan operator using this volcano you know, iterator interface, which you will be doing in that one, by the way. Now next, I will talk about index. Uh, this is kind of like a quick overview of uh, indexing structures. Then we will go into details of different kind of indexing structures. Okay? So index is designed to support operations like find all students in the CS department, find all students with GPA grading on three, things like that. And we already have a discussion on this. Suppose you are using just the heap file as it, as by itself without any other structure to facilitate uh, query answering over heap file. Or you are using a, uh, a file that's uh, in sorted order, uh, uh, sorted with respect to uh, a search key of your choice. Right? 
but but in general, right? In general, can you design some other data structure that can help you speed up the processing of this course? That's the goal of index. That additional data structure is what we refer to as the uh, indexing structure. Indexing structure. Okay. So uh, a generic description of an index structure is as follows. Any index structure must come with something called uh, data entries. And different index structures essentially differ in how they organize these data entries mm -hmm. uh, in different format, uh, in different structures. And that's how they differ from one to another. But all of them essentially is some kind of optimization over a set of data entries. So that being said, in order for us to understand any indexing structure, the very first step is to understand what is a data entry and what is a set of data entries for a given database table. Right? So a data entry has a format of a single data entry. A single data entry is something like the following. Okay, it's the format is like this. Where this is what we call as search key value. Search key value. Okay, search key value. The search key here is similarly defined as a search key concept in a, a sorted file. Right? For example, a file is sorted by uh, first name and last name, the search key is the combination of first name and last name. So search key, you can think about search key in a data entry simply as a collection of attributes that you want to build index over. Okay, that's the search key. And the value k here denotes the specific value for this search key attribute on this particular data entry. That being said, different data entries are expected to have different search key value k. So this value will be different from one entry to another. And this heuristic is essentially a way for you to get to the record that contains this particular search key value k. So you can think about this as a, a way to retrieve the record containing that search key value k. Containing that search key value k. One example of that, obviously, is RID. Why RID is essentially like a pointer to the record, right? Because it tells you the page ID and slot entry of that record. So with that information, you can go and fetch the record, right? So this connects with what I said earlier. This heuristic essentially is a method or mechanism for you to retrieve the record containing that search key value. Okay. So if this RID value is specified here, what that means is somewhere on your disk, somewhere on your disk, suppose this RID is I am 3. Okay. What that means is on your disk, there is a page I. And the third slot entry here the third slot entry here refer to a record that has a third key value k and the third key value k. You follow me? So that's essentially uh, the idea goes behind a data entry. However, Obviously, there could be multiple mechanisms for you to design what is this heuristic, right? Because it, all you need is a way to retrieve record containing that search key value k. RID certainly is one way of doing that. What are some other possible choices? What are some other possible choices? Well, we have three possible choices. The first choice is instead of storing RID as the heuristic. You can actually store the entire record here. You can just store the entire record here. That way you don't even have to, because if you store the RID, in order to retrieve the record with this search key value, you have to actually uh, pay a random I.O. 
to go and get it, right? Uh, the better approach would be simply place the record here as part of your data tree. But then that introduces overhead because if you were to do this, you have a, a data tree copy that contains the record itself, and you may have a copy of the record on this page as well. So you end up with two copies. So typically what happens if you go with uh, option one, if you go with option one is what happens is you simply conceptually you simply view the record itself as a data tree. You do not produce a data tree uh, for a record. You just view the record itself conceptually as a data tree as well. So the a record is, is serving as both a record and a data tree at the same time. So that's kind of the view you should take when you go with option one. Option two is what I have explained just now, RID of the matching record. However, there's another case though, which is if your search key is not a key for your schema, I, I explained multiple times that you should not confuse the concept of search key with the concept of key for a schema, right? These are totally different concepts. Of course, a key can serve as a search key, that's fine. If you decide to build your index over your key, then that's fine, key is your search key. And a search key can possibly be a key of a schema as well. But these are not always true, right? A key doesn't have to be a search key, and the search key is not necessarily a key for your schema. In the latter case, if a search key is not a key for your schema, what happens? Well, given the same search key value k, given the search, same search key value k, you may have multiple records having that value k, because that search key is not a key. It's not a key for your schema. For example, if my search key is first name and last name. This obviously is supposed, I'm doing this for a student table. <coughs> and obviously this search key is not a key right? for the student's table. What I mean is I may have multiple records having the same values on a given search key value. So for example, the first name is maybe Mike, last name I, I don't know, like Okay. And obviously I could have multiple records with the same name values on both first name and last name. And what happens now is so what happens now is that you will end up with if you go with this approach, with RID, right, what, what you may have is and you will have another data tree you may have many data entries with the same search key value but different RID values translate to this particular example I have multiple records with the same name and I need to produce one data entry for each one of them. Nothing wrong with this, but obviously there's some overhead here, which is you are duplicating the search key value. <coughs> you are duplicating the search key value multiple times for how many matching records you have. If the search key value size is small, not big deal. But if the search key value is big, then that introduces consider considerable uh, overhead to your system. Okay? That motivates the design of the third approach, which is Instead of doing this, well, what I can do? I can simply go with a list of RIDs that match the same third key value K. Okay. And saying that the third approach is always better than the second approach because it reduces the overhead, right? Can someone here argue for me why sometimes you want to use the second approach rather than the third approach. What are some advantages of the second approach? Yes, please. Uh, maybe if you change any of those records, like in the whole list. Okay, so that's definite one operation, right? This versus I will go to the name I 
asking before, asking that for God's name. Mike? Mike? Not Mike J. Mike, 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 Mike. Oh, okay. I'm back. I'm definitely. You know, this means to be your question, I think. Well, what Mike's side is, if, if for some reason you want to change the search key value for a particular record, this approach is very easy to make the update because you just change this value, you're done. Where in this case, you might have to grab this RD value out of this list and make another data entry. It's, it's more work and, uh, and potentially change, has impact to the structure of your index because index is built over this data entry. Right? If you change the data entries, uh, introducing one more data entry that will introduce significant overhead to index construction. Fantastic. That's one uh, potential advantage of the second approach over the third approach. What is another advantage that we actually just talked about last lecture? We talked about fixed length record versus a variable length record, right? Which is easier to deal with? Obviously, fixed length record easier to deal with. Comparing these two, assuming third key value is fixed length. Assuming this is a fixed length. Clearly, if you go with option two, you end up with fixed length data entries because RID <coughs> is always a page ID followed by a slot uh, index. Uh, this is fixed length. This is fixed length. <coughs> so this whole thing is fixed length. But if once you go with uh, uh, approach number three, even if you mark, uh, your third key value is fixed length, this whole data tree is still variable length. Uh, which means it's much harder for the underlying kernel to deal with because variableness is always much harder to work with than fixedness. So that's, that's another reason why you might prefer uh, the second approach versus the third approach. By default, unless otherwise specified, by default, most systems go with second approach rather than the first nor uh, uh, the third approach. Yeah? So here is a detailed explanation of alternative 1, and 2, and 3, so I will skip this. And the first question before you ask, uh, uh, you ask yourself before building any indexing structure is what kind of uh, queries operation you want to support? Is it a range query? A range query is a third key value greater than something, less than something. That's what I mean by a range query, whether it's a point query, whether third key value equal to a particular value exists in your database or not. So you have to ask yourself those kind of questions. And, and those are simple uh, query types. You may also ask a little bit more sophisticated query types, such as a multi-dimensional range query. Right? For example, uh, I, want to find, I want to find all restaurants or some points of interest <coughs> within two miles of a particular place. If you think about that, that translates to uh, a query like that. And if you don't have any indexing structure, what you have to do, you will have to basically linear scan everything. And imagine if you were to do that over Google Map, uh, nobody will ever use Google Map again. Okay? Uh, Google Map, I don't know how, how, how large Google Map data is. I'm not talking about just the map, but points of interest on the map at the bottom. POIs over the map. Restaurants, houses, buildings, factories, whatever, right? So if you ask, if I ask a question to Google, give me the, the, all the restaurants within two miles of where I'm standing right now, and Google Maps <coughs> start doing a linear scan over the heap file, <laughs> nobody will use Google, right, for sure. Right? So obviously some magic goes on, and the magic is uh, is index. I'm not talk, I'm not going to talk about high dimensional index because this is a high dimensional uh, query. So by default, I'm not going to cover that, but when time allows, I will come back and visit this topic later on. Okay. So there are different kind of index uh, classifications. You know, I decide before going to the detail of this, I think it's, it's better for us to look at a particular indexing structure and come back and to try to understand this concept. Because I, if I introduce this concept to you now, there are just a bunch of extra concepts. Like, who invaded who in what year, like a history class, you memorize, uh, but you don't understand what's going on. Right? So I will go into a particular indexing structure and use that to 
uh, as an illustration, we understand that, then we come back and try to understand this high level concept. And in particular, I will talk about uh, hash indexing structure. Uh, hashing is such a fundamental uh, operation uh, that you will encounter literally in all over computer <coughs> science in different subjects, right? So whether it's database systems or operating system or whatever, right? So you will use or algorithm design or machine learning, you will be using hashing. So I think it's a very interesting topic and a, a very useful uh, concept to understand as well. So without further ado, I will move on to the hashing index. Okay, then we will come back to that overview part. Okay, once we are done with hashing. Okay. So hash-based index are best for equality search. This is because the fundamental property of hashing, right? All of you, I think, to some degree, I think all of you will claim you know hashing, right? Hashing is not a big deal. You apply a hash function h over a value x that gives you an output of y. Then you do something with that y value. So, so that's what you know about hashing, right? A lot of people claim, oh, I know hashing, that's not a problem. But hashing is actually much more complex than uh, many of you have uh, thought. Okay? But as you can tell, even with this particular uh, uh, level of understanding, you can already understand why I claim hash-based indexes are good for equality search. Oh, oh. By the way, we on, on this class, unless I, uh, I specify otherwise, we are talking about we are talking about determinant state hashing, right? What that means is I may not know how you compute x to y, how this function h works, but I know for sure h x is always equal to h x no matter how many times you run it. There, there are constructs where we deal with randomized hashing uh, of, not randomized, but probabilistic hashing functions where the same input might lead you to different outputs. Okay, so that's not in our uh, discussion. That's not in our discussion. And we will look at static hashing and, and uh, dynamic hashing. So let's go with simple one, static hashing. Static hashing, the, the indexing structure looks as follows. As well. okay. And keep in mind, keep in mind we are using we are using alternative two for our data entries. What that means is the big picture is as follows. I have a disk that has multiple pages and this collectively is you conceptually this is your heap file that you are implementing right now in lab 1 okay? conceptually I take them out and flatten them out I flatten them so what I get is a collection of pages suppose I use a link link structure to augment these pages this all together is my this is my heap file, right? By the way, a sorted file can be viewed as a heap file as long as you ignore the orders. As long as you ignore the orders, they become a heap file essentially. Okay? And within each page, so this is too big, right? Let me control this using the same scale. Within each page, what happens? Inside the page is the record, right? So a micro view of a page is kind of like that. Make sense? Yeah? Now if we're using alternative two, what happened first? What happened first is you need to define a search key. Assuming we use let's say uh, first name as search key or student ID. You can you can make any arbitrary choice of your search key. That's fine. And if you're using alternative two, there is one critical observation, which is every single record will give you a distinct data entry. If you are using alternative two, sorry, I forgot to turn on the microphone. So if you are using alternative two, every single record 
will produce a data trade for you. Will produce a data trade for you. Does it make sense? Because you are using, because you are, you are basically doing some key value A at RID, and you will have one RID per record. So if you have n records, you will end up with n uh, data entries. So the view is that we ignore this one. This one, this record here, will give you a data entry here. I will call that K1. We search for that K1, and if we have an RID, I will conceptually view our RID as a pointer back to that record. Okay. And then I will have a search key value K2 conceptually point back to this. So we keep it in three. So far so good. And then all the way to let's say I have n records. <coughs> so that's the view I have. Okay? These are my data entries. So far so good. So an index, as I said, is a way to organize these data trees, right? And in particular, we're going to focus on hash uh, indexing structures. So what happened is, keep that in mind. Stop. What happens now is I will organize them using a hash table structure, using a hash table structure. But one thing you need to keep in mind is we're in Davis class. We're inside the Davis kernel. We're not sitting in RAM. We're not sitting in RAM. So it's not a <coughs> typical hash table you guys probably have used before. It's a hash table based on pages rather than based on memory units, rather than based on memory words. Right? It's a hash page, hash table based on pages. What that means is this is your hash table. Okay? Hash table contains multiple uh, hash entries or hashing. Uh, or what we call bucket. Bucket, right? So this is bucket one, bucket two, and bucket, let's say I have M bucket. So this is one, two, and two M. And each bucket is nothing else in our context inside the David kernel. Each bucket is nothing else but a page. A single this page. So this is a page. And what I want to do is grab those data entries. So I have all these data entries. I have these guys. Right? Those are my data entries. And I want to push them through uh, this hash table. And organize them somehow. That's kind of what I want to do. Do you follow me? Okay. So what I will do is I design a hash function h here. Now take the search value k. Suppose I denote this guy as k, the attribute as k. And use this to decide where to push a particular entry. Of course, a generic hash function will not have the output range in the range of 1 to m, so what you do is <coughs> well, m. So, but then you argue it's not from 1 to m, big deal, right? So we change that to that's just an index trick right, we, we use. We change the index from 1 to m to 0 to m minus 1. So essentially we are designing a function h that take k map to by the way, mathematically, this means this, one to n, essentially. That's, it's a set. Okay, that's it's a, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's not a set, it's a range. It's a range. It's specified a range of possible values. A range of possible values. So the map, it's a fun, H is a function that map the third key value k to one of the values from y to m. Or to be more, uh, more specifically, from 0 to n minus 1. Okay? Uh, here I'm using capital. So that's fine. Let me be consistent with my slides. Okay. 
All right. So then you start doing this, right? So you, you get a particular entry, suppose this is ki and rid, and you simply apply h function, this function h over ki, that's output then, suppose the output equal to 3, let's say it's equal to 1, easier than you draw, and what happened is there must be already some entries here, then you add this new data entry ki and the record ID here. That's the same entry over there. That's basically how you run it. Okay? We follow me so far? Okay, so at some point, at some point, one thing will happen, which is you use all the space from a given page. That's possible, right? You, you have used all the space from one page, and yet another guy comes KJ, and it match to one as well. It's possible, right? It match to one as well. By the way, why this may happen, why this may happen, is because, obviously, n is greater or equal than, much, much greater than n. Small n is great, much greater than capital N. Meaning the number of data entries you have obviously going to be much larger than the number of buckets you are willing to allocate for your hash table. You can argue, okay, to solve this problem, why don't I allocate, why don't I make sure uh, that's the case? Well, if that's the case, then you are not, you're not really doing anything. You, you're basically just storing these data entries one by one. one and you are wasting a lot of space. You are using one page per data entry. Remember, a data entry is really small in size. A record may be of 100 bytes. A data entry may be just tens of bytes. Why? Because you are taking one value or a couple values out of record and add RD to it that must be smaller in size compared to the RD record, which has maybe 10, 20, hundreds of attributes. Okay? So this doesn't make any sense. So typically, this happens. And when this happens, yes, you will have multiple uh, entries to one bucket using the classic paging hole argument. Have you heard of this? Uh, the paging hole argument? Uh, you have n, n of something, n paging, n boss, but you only have n minus one buckets or beans. Uh, obviously, no matter how you place them, there will be at least one bean with more than one object in it. So, but eventually this will uh, fill up the space. And so the question is where this goes? Well, the simple solution is uh, this is another allocate another page and place page A to it. Okay? So you end up with a structure like this. So far, like looks really, really trivial, right? Nothing new. And if you if you have this structure, what does it help you with? What does what does this structure help you with? Well, later on, if you try to find the record or record with search key value. to a particular value, let's say x, okay? How do you find this record? Without this structure, you will have to do a linear scan over your paper, right? You basically do a linear scan over here. Now, with this data structure, you don't have to do that anymore. What do you do? What do you do? You, you compute h of x that has an output y. You know y must be this range, right? And then you just go to, let's say y, let's say, for the argument say y equal to 1, so you simply go to this page, and instead of linear scan all your data pages, you look at only one page from your index structure, by the way, this is your index, this whole thing now is your index, you hash it. And but the question is, you don't know what data, the data entries with x, 
I could have multiple such data sets with the same value x but different RIDs. Do you follow me? So what I need to do is, and furthermore, I don't know where the data entry is located at on this page, or maybe even on these pages. By the way, these are what we call uh, overflow pages. So far, too good? How does it, um, so it goes to the page and it just scans over that page yes. instead of everything. How does it connect to the overflow pages? Oh, that's easy. So this page has some matter data values oh. that you store on the next page. Oh. Uh, but that actually brings up an excellent point, which is how do you actually locate these data entries on this page? Well, the naive solution would be to simply scan over all the data entries. If you find an entry here, if your search key value is not a key, you cannot stop. You have to go through all the overflow pages. But if you know your search key is a key, as soon as you find it, whether on this page or this page, whenever you find it, you can stop because you know there will be only one matching entry to a particular value x because it's, it's a key. Do you follow my argument? Yet another variation, yet another variation is you can be a little bit smart in how you're organizing these data entries on these pages. Currently we simply assume they are kind of like a pen only operation. Whenever you insert you just append to the end, keep going. Well, what about organizing them as a sorted file? So these guys, you mention them as a mini That's definitely possible. It's a mini solid file over those data entries on those pages. By doing that, this allows you to, to be a little bit more efficient in lookup. You can do by search over these pages, like what we did with a uh, solid file. However, then the downside, there's no free lunch. The downside is the insertion cost is high. Because you need to make sure you, instead of just go to the end of the chain and place your data entry there, now you have to do a manual search to find where it should go. So there, you have all these different trade-offs, but that's not the focus I want to discuss with you today. We understand the basic structure of this, okay? And this is called static hashing. Same like word is a beautiful place. This is perfect. I mean, I don't need anything more. However, however, let me show you a case where it's, it's very bad. Like this actually compared to linear scale over heat bulb is really, really efficient, right? Because uh, on average, suppose you don't have any overflow pages on average. Suppose that's the case. Suppose that's the case. What's the cost of this for equality search? It's just order one, I hope. Because you hash, you look at one page, the linear scan within that page doesn't count because it doesn't incur any at all. As soon as you find it, you go, boom, you're done. One I over this, plus one I over once you find it, you have to use this to go to the data file to retrieve the record. Don't forget about that. There's two I.O. So in big O is order one, constant. So what we were talking about constant versus, if you still remember the cost for heap file search, which is if you know there's only one matching, by the way, by doing this, I assume there's only one matching entry, right? Otherwise, you have to add the number of matching uh, uh, records, right? Because you need to pay, why is that adding number of matching records, right? Because in this structure, for each matching record, you will find one matching data entry. And for every such matching data entry, you need to pay I.O. to retrieve the corresponding record. That's the reason why. If you go back to heat file is 0 0.5 type and OB, that's why I hate to use this value n here because I'm abusing the notation, right? But, but keep in mind this n means different from that n over there. That n means the number of buckets you have, this n means the total number of number of items, right? number of records we have. Actually, this capital N is our small n here. Well, small max up. Sorry for this, but okay. All right. This, this capital N in our analysis for heat bulb is the total number of records we have. And B is number of records you can go to a single page. And over B is number of pages you have in total for the heat bulb. Okay, but just keep in mind all these different notations. So, a problem though is 
Fantastic. Assuming you have only one matching input, we're talking about order one versus a big number. Huge, huge savings. Huge, huge savings. So you, no brainer, you should always use this. By the way, you may argue, yes, this is very useful, but this introduces overhead. In addition to store these pages, you now have to store these pages. But keep in mind, n records will give you how many pages? n record goes to n over b pages, right? That's the number of pages you will hit by. n record, if you're using alternative 2, give you n data entries, right? n data entries. How many pages they will occupy? How many pages they will occupy? And over something, <coughs> something I don't know, because it depends on the data entry size, which is essentially the size of a P value. But I know one thing for sure, this question mark is going to be greater and greater equal than B. Why? Because how you calculate B is your page size over your object <coughs> size. Where object size is, in this case, is your record size, in this case, it is your data entry size. And record size is much bigger than data entry size, which means this value must be greater or greater equal than B. With that being said, coming back here, what you, what, you, what you know, now know, is the total number of pages here is much smaller than the total number of pages you have in your data file. So this overhead is almost nothing. Almost nothing. Okay? But one potential downside is, sounds fantastic. But one important assumption, implicit assumption we use when we, when we claim, oh, this is order one, constant. We actually make a subtle assumption. What is that assumption? The assumption is, you do not have these guys. Or at least, you do not have a long chain of these guys. Maybe occasionally you have one of this, that's okay, from one to two, big deal, I don't care. But what happens if you end up in a situation like this, which is and all the other pages are empty. Actually, let me abandon that location on the slides. I will change this back to M. I think it's like it's confusing for me as well. Okay, let's change this to M page. Okay. Abandon them. Abandon that location on, on the slide. So now we are back to uh, the beautiful world. Right? In real world, real world is kind of like this. Something always gonna mess up somewhere. Right? But imagine we're living in an ideal situation, ideal world. Everything, everybody does his or her share. So, uh, obey the rule, obey the law. So we're nice and square. They were here. But even but, but if this is the case, what happens? Your cost is no longer O1. Obviously not O1. What is your cost? Your cost is, suppose this question mark is B prime. Okay? Where B prime is much bigger than B. Your search cost, instead of paying this cost, what's your search cost? It's actually, again, assuming you know there's only one matching record. Why? Of course, plus one. Why? Well, essentially, what you did is instead of doing a key file scan over this key file, you're doing a key file scan over this key file, which is built over your data entries. That's a key file over your record, this is a key file over your, rec uh, over your data entries. You follow me? And, and they occupy this many pages, so in the worst case, you have to scan about half of them to locate the data tree match with your search key value X. Still, you know, better than that, but then uh, not as ideal as just only one cost. Can we achieve the, the fundamental challenge now is can we do that only one cost no matter what? You may argue, wait a minute, this will never happen, right? Come on, I use a hash function, this will never happen. But you never know. You may be designing a really a naive hash function where you define your hash function like this. That's a hash function, right? That is a hash function. The definition is take a value k, the max, <coughs> one of the value in the range of 1 to m, 
my hash function is this, it is a hash function. It is a hash function. But you may ask you, who will be ever using a stupid hash function like that? I will never design a hash function like that. However, sometimes even if you you know, if you don't put some careful thought into your hash function, you may end up in a situation like this. I will give you some examples later on, but keep this in mind. This is a big question mark that we will come back later on. How we design a good hash function? How we design a good hash function? How we design a good hash function? So, for example, I want to, you know, as a real example, we have about 40 students here, right? 30 some students here. And I want to hash all of you to, let's say, 10 different groups. So each group roughly has three of you. That make sense? Three of you. If I look at only the first row, I may come up with a hash function and say, OK, if close equal to blue color, output equal to 0. That perfectly aligned with the first row because all three of them end up one, in one group. You have a blue shirt, right? Inside, right? So not not the sweater. So so looking at that first row, I end up with a group of three. Perfect. But if I keep looking, second row, I check second row, oh, no blue color. So my hash function is fantastic. Keep going, keep going until I go over there, then I realize now this become a bad hash function. This become a bad hash function. So how do I design a good hash function? Well, I have to use some of your attributes, like right? the color of your clothes, or where you're from, your height, your duty, or whatever. I, I need to use some kind of combination of that and design a hash function such that perfectly uh, all of you are hashed into a group of three somehow. How do I design that? And even more, even more challenging, remember, in this case, it's actually a relatively easy game to play for me. Why? Because I can see the data. I can see the data. I know there are 40 elements, 40 objects. I can try all different combinations until I find one combination, three of you end up in one group. You follow me? But imagine if you are playing this against a adversary. You are like playing a chess. There's a player over there that we cannot see. He gave me, he or she gave me these 40 samples first. Say, okay, design your hash function. I design my hash function. And then that, that adversary come in and look at my hash function and say, oh, you got what you did that? Are you sure? Are you sure? I, I said, I'm sure. Okay, I'm done. That person may come in and change the data or add more data to it. That make sense? So if you have to play this in an adversary setting. So this makes the game really, really hard for me who did that hash function. Right? So how do you design an effective hash function? Uh, we will leave this at a big question mark. Uh, we can come back to this later on, later on today. Okay? Now, I will introduce, go on, and assuming typically a good hash function, a, a, a simple and good hash function in practice is simply, of course, you can take this whole thing, mod and a min, where p is a prime. And A and B are two random values chosen from the field of that prime P. Uh, for a prime number, the field of a prime P is you know as BP is essentially from 1 to P minus 1. So A and B are chosen randomly from those values. And what I will claim this is a good hash function. And you may argue why this is a good hash function. Uh, to actually to answer that question is a very, very challenging problem. Uh, we will talk about this later on. But keep this in mind. For now, I will just use this kind of hash function. Right? And later on, I will explain to you why this is actually a good hash function. It's actually a very deep question to ask. And not so easy to answer as well. Now, one way to address this problem, there are two ways of addressing this. One is make sure you have a good hash function never end up with a skewed distribution of your values. A good hash function means that you have a balanced distribution of your values to different buckets. But no matter how good your hash function is, if you play this as an online adversary setting, online, pay attention to the keyword online, meaning 
So the grocery can look at your hash function and then decide what values to add to your input. Does that make sense? So that's the online game I'm talking about. And the negative result is, it's actually fairly, fairly easy to, to understand this. No matter how you design your hash function, and no matter how good the hash function A is to begin with, if you play this game, you know, it's worth resetting in an online fashion, you cannot end up with a good hash function always. Because the adversary can look at the behavior of your hash function and start inserting values that map, always map to same or similar buckets. That make sense? Online. Keep, keep the this is the key word for now. Online. Meaning adversary doesn't give all his or her inputs to you at once, doesn't fix his or her input at once, rather decide those one by one on the fly. Based on what you do, based on what you do. Then there's nothing you can do. Even if you design a good hash function, you still may end up in really bad situations. To address that, we introduce the concept of dynamic hash. Obviously, the only way to fix that is to update the structure from time to time based on the observation of the output, right? So that introduces the concept of dynamic hash. And in particular, there are two classic structures people have designed. One is called extendable hashing, the other is called linear hashing. I will talk about extendable hashing first, then linear hashing. You can read this slide, or uh, I will skip that slide and go through this with you uh, with an example. Okay, go through this with, with an example. So first of all, we all understand what problem we are trying to tackle, right? We are trying to tackle this problem. Static hashing doesn't solve this. Even if you're using supposedly a good hash function, it still may end up in a situation like this. Okay, that's the problem. Now, how we address this? <coughs> All right. How we address this? Okay, so the way you do this is as follows. Okay, you maintain the structure like I show on this slide. That means from 0 to 3. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So you, you encode them using binary representations. Using binary representations. And each entry points to a bucket. Points to a bucket. A bucket is nothing else but a page. So these guys is simply a page. Think about this as a page. So for illustration purpose, I'm using really small page size where each page contains only four data entries. In practice, obviously, that's much bigger. That's the B prime value there. That's much, much bigger than four. But obviously, I cannot draw a, a big bucket like that. So I'm using just four for illustration. So this, this four here is essentially this B prime, uh, a B prime value I'm talking about. Right? How many data entries you can fit in one page or one bucket? You follow me? And looking at a particular bucket, what it has is a number of data entries up to B prime of them. For the B prime I defined earlier. For the B prime I defined earlier. You find this value by using page size divided by data entry size. That's the maximum number of data entries you can fit in one page. And it has the local depth. A local depth, the requirement is it must be grid, uh, sorry, less than or equal to global depth. So in my particular example, I have a setup like that. Okay, what that means. 
Okay, it basically means the following. Okay, pay attention to what I'm gonna say next. Okay, you have a, you still have a hash function, h. Still, so this guy is still here. Remember, I never erase that. So you still have a hash function h. Now hash, when you have a have, when you have a record r that has a particular associated with a particular data entry called let's say x and R D, right? So somewhere there's an attribute value x, right? That's kind of the setup. That's the record, that's the data entry of this record. Do you follow me? And you're trying to decide where the data entry for this record should go in this hash index structure, right? In this hash index structure. So what you do is take the value of x, you hash it, that must give you an output y. You follow me? Must give you an output y. So pay attention to what I'm going to say next. Okay? You look at this. You look at last. What's the best way to, uh, to explain this? So you look at, you convert this to binary representations. So if how many bits you have in Y, that's depending on your architecture. Let's say we're in 64 bit machines. You will have 64 bits with Y. Also, depend on obviously depend on the output range of your hash function. Does that, that make sense so far? Sure. Nevertheless, <coughs> what I do is I look, only look at no matter how many bits you, you use to represent Y in binary format, I only look at as you know this at global depth as this value as D plus D bits. I only look at the last D bit. You follow me? Last D bit. <coughs> to decide where this data tree goes. To decide where this data tree goes. So for example, if HR, actually by HR, I'm abusing the notation, I'm actually hashing over the third key value of that record R. That's what I mean by it. So you take the third key value X out of R and you hash it. Suppose the output is 5, so in binary it's 1, 0, 1. Since our global depth is 2, we, we consider this goes to 0, 1. If the output is 7, 1, 1, 1, it goes to this entry here. And once you are at the entry, what do you do? You do not, this is the key point, you do not place the data entry under that global directory. Because this is nothing else but just a simple index value. <coughs> the data entry doesn't go here. What's, what you do is, once you end up here, you follow the pointer from that global entry to retrieve the bucket it should go to. So if it's 0, 1, you go to this bucket. If it's 1, 1, you go to this bucket. Now you may ask me, what's the significance of the local depth? As you can tell, when local depth is 1 and global depth is 2, what that means? That means there are two global entry is pointing to, to the same bucket. Effectively, what's happening, what's happening here is what? Is that entry here, you don't differ them by looking at last two bits. You differ them by looking at only last one bit. That's why this is actually never possible, because one and zero never end up in the same bucket. So it should be, this is possible. So you, entries, data entries here, they differ from each other. You, do, you, you try to differentiate them using only last one bit. That's the reason why these two entries will all point to the same bucket here, because the last one bit of them is the same. <coughs> Even though the last two bits are different, but the last one bit is the same. And that bucket has a local depth of one, so I will simply point all of them to the same bucket. Even though the global depth is telling you to use two bits, but for this this particular entry, you only look at the last one bit. You may wonder why. Why sometimes you look at last two bits, sometimes you look at last one bit. Uh, here is a reason why. So I will show you. So this suppose this is what we start with. The reason is we want to get rid of overflow buckets. We don't want to have any overflow buckets, and that's the reason why we end up with a structure like this. Let me show you using a number of insertions. Suppose I have 
these guys. By the way, when I say insert 21 and insert 19 and 15, for ease of illustration, this refer to the hash output, not the X before the hashing, rather the hashing output Y. Does that make sense? So keep in mind these are hashing output already. I don't care what, what is the original input, but they hash to these values. <coughs> Is that okay? By the way, what's my hash function? I can simply use the ax plus b plus b. Okay? I will just use that as my hash function. Okay? As I explained earlier. Okay? So these are my hash output. And I look at, the, and these are the binary representation of them. Since my global depth is 2, I will look at only what? Last two bits. So where should 21 go, by the way? Go to? 0, 1. But if you go to 0, 1, what happens in this example? You do not have space left on that page, on that bucket. And keep in mind, the extendable hashing says, I do not allow any overflow buckets. Because that's the goal of what we started with, right? We started with the goal of fixing overflow buckets. So we don't want to have any overflow buckets. So what do you do? You have to split that bucket by increasing the local depth. In other words, intuitively, if you think about it, intuitively, if you think about it, initially there are four entries there. You claim, okay, looking at the last one bit is good enough because I have, I have space. You, you, if you think about this, I have a scholarship to give out. And I can give the scholarship to four people. And I have four applicants currently. Right? So I say, okay, I look at you, you great from database class. If it's about 3.0, I'll give you scholarship. And I happen to have three, four students with database great, greater than 3.0. Fine, you know, fine. But now I have another guy coming. He or she got 3.5 in database. Now I have five qualified candidates, but I only have scholarship for four of them. What do you do? You cannot only look at just database class, right? You will say, okay, fine. Your database grade has to be greater than 3.0, and your compiler grade must be greater than 3.2. So you look at one more feature, right? That's why you look at one more bit. That's essentially what's going on here. I look at the last one bit. Now, I don't have enough space, so I look at last two bits to differentiate them. You follow me? So I increase the local depth, create a new bucket, Really distribute those entries, this entries, plus the new entry, the new guy coming in. So five of them will be redistributed into those two buckets. But now, redistributing them using last two bits instead of last one bit. So seven will end up here. If you do the math. The last two bits of 7 is 1, 1 instead of 0, 1. And 21 will go there. And you will also update the global entry. For some reason, the protector keeps that line. But imagine that line is gone. Okay? That line is gone. Okay? I don't know why it gave me that effect. The line should be gone. The line is not there anymore. Do you follow me? <coughs> Okay? Alright, let's keep doing this experiment. Keep doing this experiment. Where 19 should go to? Right? Where, what about 15? Easy, right? So we have no workflow buckets, everything is balanced. And if you use this to do lookup, you're guaranteed to have to go to no overflow buckets. So we achieve our objective. But however, keep, keep going, right? So I move this over to the next slide, and I'm going to insert 20. Uh, what's the binary value of 20? Can someone check that really quick? 18 is 1. Uh, huh? 16 is uh, 16 must be 0, 0. So 20 must be 0, 0. So, just, so that's the way you look at it. 16 must be 0, 0. Because it's a power, power of 2. 20 is not power of 2, so I cannot say for sure. Anything that's power 2 must be 0, 0, except the last one bit, right? right? So 20 is that 
add 4 to it, so it must be uh, the last 2 bits is still 0, because add 4 to it meaning you the last 2 bits kept to 0, the, the third bit is become 1. Of flipping that circuit, whatever that first circuit to begin with. So 20 must be in first bucket. So you do the same thing, you argue, okay, I increase my local depth. I redistribute them. So 32 and 16 stay there, not, not surprising, because they are power of 2. And the other guys go to the new bucket. However, now you have a problem. What's your problem? Your local depth is more than your global depth. What that means is translate to English language. What that means is human language. What that means is number of buckets is more than what you can index for. You only have four global entries, but now I have five local depths. I have five local buckets. So what do you do? You increase the, uh, the global depth. But when you increase the global, sorry, the global depth, what happens? Do you increase the number of global entries by one? No. It's kind of like in C or C++. When you shift the number by one bit, you actually double it. Right? When you, when you shift one by one bit, it becomes two. When you move again, that becomes not three, but four. When you shift again, that's eight instead of five. So you end up with this. And what do you, what do, you do? Most of them will point to, two of them will point to the same bucket. That's when the local depth is smaller than the global depth. So multiple global entries will point to the same bucket. Whereas the ones you have just split it, causing the global depth to be doubled, uh, they will be pointed by a single global entry. And this process continues. And deletion is uh, the reverse. When do, you, when, do you, when do you merge global entries? Or in other words, when do you decrement global depths by one? When every local entry is pointed by more than one, <laughs> global entry, that's when you can reduce the global depth by one. So for example, if I keep deleting 16 and 32, then I can decrement the global depth and reduce the number of global entries by half. You follow me? And this structure, if you do the math, if you follow the discussion along the way, it has no overflow pages, no overflow pages, and the, co the cost is constant. But many of you, if you are, if you are, if you, if you are sharp enough, you will realize the uh, adversary can play against me. Right? What I will do is I will keep inserting into one bucket here or there. I don't care. But I will keep inserting entries into the bucket with the maximum local depth. The maximum local depth at any point must be equal to the global depth. Otherwise. If you max local depth with less than global depth, you should already decrease your global depth. So I will keep inserting into that, that local depth, the max local depth bucket. What, what would you end up with, by the way, if you think about it? If you have two buckets, only two buckets, that have local depth equal to global depth, and your directory entry has doubling, keep doubling after many several insertions, and all the other buckets have a local depth value that's much smaller than the global depth, and multiple global entries pointing, not, not necessarily just two, but multiple global entries might point to the same local bucket. Actually, you can do a simple exercise to calculate what's the worst case. When my global depth is a value n, <coughs> what is the worst case for the structure? The best case for the structure is you happen to have two to the power n local buckets then that's what you have to do. That's fantastic news. You are not wasting any of your space or structure, right? But what's the worst case? When you have global depth equal to n, what's the worst case? Is it n plus one bucket? n plus two buckets? Or what that value is? I leave that as a question for you to think about. And next lecture, I will introduce the next structure called linear hashing that is designed to exactly address this problem. This, this problem of keep doubling global entries and keep inserting to the same part. We will introduce that something called linear hashing, and it is a fundamental structure that you will probably encounter in your Google or Facebook or other interviews. Okay, all right. <coughs>